We're grateful that you've come to the Lord's house with God's Word, and we want to look at the Scriptures together as always. And uh, I know a lot of times when we're on the inside, you've got it on big screens up here behind me. Well, you don't today, so you need your Bible. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5 and also Matthew chapter 16. We touched on Matthew chapter 5 last week, and uh, we're going to get into it here in just a moment. I just want to start off and share some good news with you. I mean, some really good news. There are no elections in heaven. No politics in heaven. No politicians in heaven. Heaven is not a democracy. It is not a republic. It is a kingdom, and it is ruled by the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Almighty, holy, eternal Creator God rules heaven, and that's what we want to focus on today. All right? Now, that's going to lighten somebody's burden because some of you thought I was going to talk about nothing but elections, but we're not. It is too important to know about the kingdom of heaven. It's the greatest place that anybody can possibly be, and the Bible talks about it. We mentioned it last week in the fifth chapter in the third verse in the first of what's called the Beatitudes, and we're going to look at it there again this morning. Anybody can wind up in heaven and spend an eternity there. Anybody can. Let's take a look at this third verse of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is preaching to His disciples and He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It belongs to them. He used the word blessed there, and the word blessed means more than just happy, although a lot of your modern translations only use that word as happy. It's a lot more than that. I'm happy to see you here, but that's got no comparison to the depth of the meaning of this word. This word means somebody is happy because they are supremely blessed by God and approved by God. They've got God's stamp of approval on themselves and on their lives, and therefore they are happier than anybody else could possibly be. If God does not approve of you, how could you be happy? But here he's saying, blessed, happy, supremely blessed are some people. Who are they? Those who are the poor in spirit. We don't usually equate poor with happy or blessed. We go check our banking account or a checking account or your debit card or whatever, the money in your pocket, and if there's not enough, you say, I'm not too happy. This has nothing to do with money. It talks about being poor in spirit. Somebody who is poor in spirit is somebody who goes to God and realizes and acknowledges to God they've got nothing to offer God worthy of being allowed into His holy heaven. They look at their own lives and all they see is their own sin. They don't come to God saying, I'm righteous, I'm holy, you need to let me into heaven. They don't say, look at all my good works, you need to let me into heaven. Dear God, I'm going to trade you what I am and what I have for a heavenly kingdom. No, no, that's not how you get there. Anybody that's approaching God with the idea that we can trade Him or we've got something to offer Him to make us worthy, you're not poor in spirit. No, you're prideful in your spirit, and there's a huge difference. But blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who approach God with no more than filthy, dirty lives and empty hands, saying, God, I've got nothing to offer you. All I can do, dear God, is be like a beggar on a street corner, saying, I've got nothing. I can cry out to you for mercy and forgiveness, and it's going to have to be a free gift from you. I can't trade. I can't buy. I need a free gift. And you know that's exactly what God told us. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, what does he say? The wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. Physical death and spiritual death. The first death and the second death. The second death being cast alive into the lake of fire. That's what we've earned. But he said, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can anybody honk a horn on that? It's a gift. It's a gift. 
you can't earn it. All you can do is accept it or reject it. God says, I've got a gift for you of eternal life. And you have to come to me realizing and acknowledging the fact that's the only way you're going to receive eternal life. That's the only way you're going to enter into heaven. It's saying, I've got nothing to offer you, God, except a sin-saturated life that deserves death and deserves hell. And when somebody comes to God realizing that and repenting of their sins and trusting Jesus as their Savior, according to this verse, the kingdom of heaven is yours. It's yours. You've got some real estate in heaven. It belongs to you. Maybe you want to rejoice in that today. I, I hope it's true for everybody that's listening. But if it's not yours for certain, don't quit. Don't tune us out because it can be yours before you leave here today. With that thought in mind, go with me now to the 16th chapter of Matthew. You're in Matthew chapter 5. Go to 16th chapter in Matthew. In the 13th verse, we find again Jesus talking to His disciples. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, which is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist had already been beheaded. Oh, some say Elias or Elijah and others, Jeremiah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then listen to Jesus' question. First he asked, what are other people saying? But then he said, he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Now it's personal. Now it's, it's not a poll that they're taking. It, it's not a matter of a vote that's being, no, no. He said, you, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the most important question anybody can ever ask you, and God ask you, who is Jesus to you? To you personally, who is He to you? Not just what do the preachers say, not just what does the church teach, not just what does the Bible say, but who is He to you personally? Your relationship to Him. You may say, well, I agree with Simon Peter. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you'll notice, Simon didn't say a Christ. He said the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the only one who ever has been or ever shall be. He said, Jesus, you're it. There is no other. God has no other provision. It's exclusive. Well, Simon, Simon, that's the right answer. But Simon Peter, you, don't go, you didn't go far enough with your answer. You acknowledged who Jesus is in reality. But your answer wasn't personal enough. Simon, is He your Christ? Is He your Messiah? Is He your Savior? More than just the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, is He yours? Have you accepted Him as your own personal Lord and Savior? That's the question. You start with the information that you believe about Jesus being true, and then you formulate that, and you use that to put your faith and trust in Him. And once you do that, He becomes your Christ, your Savior, your Messiah. Simon didn't go quite far enough in that. But we're going to ask you that question. Who is Jesus to you? Sitting there in your car in the parking lot this morning. Who is Jesus to you? Is He your Christ? Is He your Messiah? Is He your Savior? Is He your Lord? Or is He just the one that you believe is the one the Bible talks about and you believe the Bible is true? Oh, it's wonderful. That's the right place to start. But it needs to be personal. Listen, your relationship to Jesus is what really matters a lot more than what you believe in your head to be true about Him. You start with a head belief, but when you trust Him as Savior and your Lord, it becomes personal. It's in your heart. It's entirely different. If Jesus doesn't save your soul 
from the hell that you have earned, the death, the first death, the second death that you have earned, if He does not save your soul from that, you won't be saved. There is no other Christ. There is no other Savior. There is no other hope. Who is Jesus to you? Go with me now to the 17th verse. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah, meaning the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. <laughs> he said, You're, you, you gave me this answer not because somebody else told you and you believed it was true. Oh, perhaps you did believe it was true when somebody else told you, but that's not the way you gave me the answer. You gave me this answer because God Himself revealed it to you. I want to say this to you this morning. If Jesus Christ is your Savior, your Lord, your Messiah, the one you're trusting, it's because God has revealed that truth to you. He has revealed the truth about Him to you and He has drawn you to His Son, Jesus. You didn't just say, okay, I believe it's true, I'm going to go on about my life. No, no. I'm going to let Jesus impact my life. I want Jesus to change my life. I want Jesus to change my eternal destiny. I, I'm, God, you're the one that's given me this desire and that's what I want to do. You see, when God reveals that truth to somebody, he does something, a process of drawing that individual to Jesus. You, you can't just believe it that Jesus is God's Son, died on the cross, buried, rose again, and ascended back into heaven. You can't just believe that in your head and say that's enough. No, you want Him. You want that personal relationship to Him. And the reason you want that personal relationship to Him is because His Father is drawing you to Jesus. Jesus put it this way in John the 6th chapter in the 44th verse. He says, No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draws him. You just won't come on your own. He says, Oh yeah, I would. No, you wouldn't. Because you've got that old flesh going on. You've got that old sinful nature, nature going on. You've got a Satan in hell who wants to take you into the flames with him. Listen, no, you're not going to come on your own. God the Father has to draw you to Jesus or you don't come. But I want to tell you something. If you're coming to him, Almighty God is drawing you to his son. You can rejoice over that. Almighty God loves you enough that he sacrificed his son and now he's drawing you to him. Well, God drew Simon Peter to Jesus. Simon Peter came, and he trusted Jesus, and he was saved. So let me just ask you, here in the East Street Baptist Church parking lot, has God drawn you to Jesus? Has He drawn you to Jesus? And if He has drawn you or is drawing you, the question is, have you come to Jesus? Have you come to that point where I'm not going to continue living my life the way that I used to over there. Jesus is over here and I'm coming to Him. God is drawing me to Him. I'm willing to leave whatever that I need to leave behind so that I can come to Jesus. Are you drawn to Jesus? Are you coming to Him? And are you trusting Him, the Christ, the Son of the living God, as your personal Savior? If your answer to those questions is yes, I've got some wonderful news for you. Your place in the kingdom of heaven is guaranteed. Somebody ought to go beep beep on that one. <laughs> Absolutely. It's guaranteed. God said so. Maybe, maybe God has been drawing you for a while and you've accepted the facts and the reality of Jesus of who He is but you've never come to Him personally. You've never surrendered your heart and life to Him personally. And you don't have that personal relationship with Him. Maybe that's your condition this morning. Maybe you've refused to come saying, I I'm going to trust you, Jesus, but not now. I, I got too many things going on in my life. I'm trying to recover from a hurricane. Jesus, I don't have time to fall on my face before you. I'm dealing with COVID at my house. I don't have time to get on my face before you and deal with my sin and my eternal destiny. 
Maybe you're saying, that's what I need to do. I want to do it. I plan on doing it before I die, but not today, not just yet. I'll do it later. When's later? When's later going to be for you? Before you take your last breath, you say, yeah, that's what. That, before I take my last breath, that's exactly what I want to do. I don't want to die without Jesus because I don't want to spend an eternity without Him. But right now, I don't have to deal with it. I, I can't. I'm too involved, uh, too wrapped up in other things. The politics have got me so confused. I, I can't focus. If you're going to wait till your last breath, I want to let you know something. Your death may be so sudden that you will have no warning except this one right now. This might be your only warning. Your last breath may be yours in your lungs right now before you get out of the parking lot. You're going to wait till your last breath? God may not draw you to Jesus tomorrow because tomorrow may not ever come for you. Don't put it off. Don't wait. If you're feeling even the slightest urge to come to Jesus and trust Him and be saved right now, listen, it's because God is drawing you to His Son. He loves you and He's drawing you. So do it. Just do it. You know, when we give an invitation inside the church building, we invite people to come forward and make it public. You can do it right there in your car as private as you want to be, and nobody but you and God will know. You don't need to let Satan lie to you and say, oh, you'd be embarrassed. Those people will think you're a sinner. Don't do it publicly. No, it's between you and the Lord. It's private. It's personal. Do it today, and you will never regret it. Now I want to go one more verse. One more verse in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. After Peter had made his confession of his faith and Jesus said his father had drawn him, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That particular verse of Scripture has been misinterpreted for a long, long time. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In spite of what has been taught for centuries, Jesus did not build His church on Simon Peter. He did not. He said, well, I don't know. I've always heard that. Here's why I can tell you He didn't. First off, is the words that He used. When He said, Thou art Peter, He used the Greek word Petros. P-E-T-R-O-S is the way we would spell it. Petros is a small rock, a small stone, one that you can hold in your hand, one that you can pick up and throw out there into the field. He said, that's what you are, Peter. Simon, now Peter. Your father named you Simon. I'm calling you Peter. I'm saying you're hard like a rock. But Peter, you can be moved. You can be picked up and you can be tossed and you can be thrown. That's what you are. Thou art Petros. But then he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He didn't use the same word there. There he used the word Petra. P-E-T-R-A is the way we would spell it. As a matter of fact, you go into the country of Jordan today, and you will find the location of an ancient city called this Petra. City half as old as time, they say. It's a solid rock city carved out of a rock mountain. It's been there for centuries and centuries and centuries, and you can still go there. If you saw one of the Indiana Jones movies, it was filmed there. Most unusual place in all the world. I've had the privilege of going. That is not a rock you can pick up and throw. Petra is a solid rock mountain. And Jesus says, I'm building my church on a solid rock mountain. Simon, it's not on a little rock that can be moved. It's on the rock that cannot be moved. And I'm convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt when Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, I think He did that. On this rock I will build my church. Amen. What's the church of Jesus Christ built on? Jesus Himself. Amen. Himself. He doesn't change. He doesn't get moved. He doesn't get thrown away. He doesn't get distracted. 
Jesus Himself. He is the rock upon which He is building His church. He's the rock of all ages. We sing that song sometimes. He's the solid rock on which we stand. We sing that too. And He is building His church on Himself, the very foundation stone, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. Then look what He says in that verse. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is a strange thought, strange wording. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against my church. When we read the word hell, we think of the place of fire and brimstone where Satan and his demons are going to be cast and every lost soul is going to be burning. That, that's not the word that he used here. He used the word Hades. It's not the place of torment. This is the place of death. This is the unseen realm of, de of the dead. So what was Peter say, or Jesus saying? He's saying the gates of death are not going to stop my church. You can't kill enough Christians to stop the church. 2,000 years, Christians have been dying and the church goes on. That's proof, isn't it? 2,000 years of Christians dying. Where's the church? Still going on. Sometimes in a parking lot, sometimes in a building, sometimes on a street corner. But the church goes on. The gates of hell cannot stop the church. When somebody dies without Christ, they pass through the gates of death. And the gates of death slam shut behind them. And they don't come back. But that's not true for Christians, you see. Because the moment we trust Jesus as our Savior and Lord, what does God do? He gives us the gift of eternal life. Life. Eternal life. The gates of hell can't stop that. The gates of death cannot stop eternal life. God gives it to us. and We've got it. So we don't need to worry about death. It's nothing for us to fear. Death will not stop the church. Not only death won't stop the church, neither will anything else. Changes in governments cannot stop the church. Countless governments around the world for these 2,000 years have been trying to do away with the church. Guess what? Church still going on. So don't worry about the government stopping the church. There's going to be efforts. There always will be. The enemy will always attack and always try to stop the church, but he can't do it. Can I tell you, COVID-19 cannot stop the church. So stop worrying about it. It's not going to stop the church. Don't let politics or a virus or even death frighten you. If you're saved, you've got nothing to fear. Absolutely nothing to fear. Listen, long after 2020 is no more than a dot on a page in history somewhere, if the planet lasts that long, Oh, long past that day, we're going to be marching on. The church is going to be marching on. And we're going to be marching on either here or on streets of gold in heaven because the church cannot be defeated by death. Don't have anything to worry about. Rejoice. God has given us all that we need. We've lost people. We say lost them. We've lost their presence with us in recent days. One brother as recently as yesterday went on to be with the Lord. He'd had a very difficult life. He had been very, very ill. They'd been cutting off parts of his body trying to preserve and extend his life until finally he'd had enough. Yesterday afternoon, that brother took his final breath And he left that body behind, what was left of it. He left that old mutilated body behind. And according to God's holy word, he was absent from that body and in the presence of the Lord that quick. Even quicker than that. And so it shall be for every believer. There comes that moment in time when we will leave these bodies behind. I watched my mother do that just a few days ago left that body behind and in the presence of the Lord. 
no longer struggling to breathe, no longer in pain, no longer dealing with the ravages of age on her old body. No. I'm going to tell you something. There was a celebration going on in heaven. Her family, my father, all kinds of folks. I believe the Lord Jesus was jumping and clicking his heels saying, well, you finally got here, Vern. I've been waiting for 102 years for you. Why not? We have nothing to fear. Listen, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So let's go back to the question that Jesus asked Simon. He said, who am I to you? Who am I to you? Let me rephrase that. If the gates of hell, the gates of death, are not going to stop the church, are you part of the church? Oh, I don't mean are you a member of East Ridge Baptist Church or any other Baptist Church or any other church with a label. I'm talking about the Bride of Christ. All the born-again believers. Are you part of that group of people? If so, you have eternal life and you've got nothing to fear because one day death is going to usher you into the presence of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and there's going to be a celebration and a joy that you cannot even imagine right now. Are you part of the church? Right now. If there was some way to measure your faith in Jesus, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being absolutely the maximum faith anybody could possibly have, how would you measure your faith in Jesus? Say, well, I, I believe in who He is. I'm, that's one. <laughs> I believe what the Bible says is true. That, that's two. I, I believe this and this and this. The question is, what's your personal relationship with Jesus? Is He... Not just the Christ is He yours. Not just the Savior is He yours. Not just the Lord, but is He yours. Have you trusted Him as your Savior and your Lord? Have you received Him and given yourself over to Him? Are you trusting Him right now as your Savior and as your Lord? If you were to die in the next 30 seconds, where would you be? If you're not absolutely certain you're trusting Jesus and you're saved, this would be a great time and a great place to do it, right where you are. And I want to suggest this to you. If you have never trusted Jesus and have never been saved, that's the whole reason God brought you this morning. He didn't bring you here just to toot your horn and sit in the parking lot. He, he didn't bring you here just to listen to Brother John lead to singing or Pat play the piano or hear me preaching. No, He came, brought you here in order to draw you to Jesus so you will trust His Son and be saved. Why don't you do it right now? I want to give you a chance to do it right now. We're going to close the service. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you pray with me? Or you, maybe you're one of those that I'm saved. I know I'm saved, but I'm not sure about the person sitting in the car with me. Let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we come to you saying thank you for loving us the way that you do. Lord, I can't comprehend your love is too great. I know that when I came to you, I not only had filthy, sin-stained hands, my whole life was filthy and sin-stained. And I had nothing to offer you but guilt. And Father, I pray for others that are like that here today that have already surrendered to you, cried out to you for mercy and forgiveness, for eternal life. Oh, Father, for those that have been saved, I pray that you'll affirm that in their heart and in their soul right now. Let them know beyond any shadow of doubt they belong to you and the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And Father, I pray for it anybody that's listening right now that might be having that doubt not certain but they want to be give them the faith that it takes to repent of every sin they've ever committed or shall give them the faith that it takes to cry out dear Jesus thank you for dying on the cross for me so God can forgive me 
because of what you've done. Give them the faith to cry out to dear Jesus, save me now. Come into my heart, become my Savior and my Lord. I surrendered all to you. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers today. And Father, I pray for those that you might be drawing to Jesus, but they're not coming right now for one reason or another. Satan's built a barrier between them and you. Give them another chance. And Father, if it's pleasing to you, not only would you give them another chance, but maybe you'd give us an opportunity to sit down and pray with them and help them. And Father, for those that are sure they're saved, give us the opportunity to go tell somebody else how wonderful it is to be a child of God. Have your way with us now, Father. Keep us safe as we leave this place and go about our way. And Lord, if it's pleasing to you, you'd bring us back next Sunday and many more with us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. <laughs>